My name is Susan Leary. I'm the director of the Veterans Education Project, and I'm I'm thrilled that we have a full house, and I'm regretful to say that we actually seem to have standing room only in the back, so there may be a little shuffling of chairs. Uh, I'm just going to do a brief amount of housekeeping. Several people have asked me about restrooms and water fountains. If you go out that way and then take a left after a dividing wall, you'll find both restrooms and fountains. Um, I'm going to say this event is made possible in part due to funding from the Mass Humanities Foundation, from the Markham Nathan Fund for Social Justice, and from donors of the Veterans Education Project, and we really do appreciate their support. Um, I want to collectively thank our many co-sponsors. We have various signs up saying who they are. They became so numerous after a while that I'm not going to mention each one separately, but we're really uh, very thankful to have such deep interest in the community in this event. Um, when we do events like this, we try to have resources for veterans available in case any of you either are veterans or no veterans or military family members who li might like to know of resources in the community. So I believe we have Brian from the Springfield Vet Center here somewhere. Brian, could you raise your hand? So Brian's back here. Um, and he has a table out there. If you have any questions about resources at the Springfield Vet Center, he's the guy to talk to. So thanks so much for coming. Um, we also have Victor from Veterans Advocacy Services here, and he's also someone you can come and talk to afterwards. Steve Connor from the Northampton Veterans Services is planning on coming, but said he might be coming a little late. So if you're wanting to connect with him, he's an amazing resource. Come and find me afterwards, and I'll try to connect you with him. Um, we have some honored guests here tonight who are not part of the panel, but who we're very excited have come. One is uh, Dr. Jonathan Shea. I don't know if you want to raise your hand and say hi. So he really has uh, been an amazing force behind bringing this sort of conversation forward in the community, both with post-traumatic stress work and with terms like moral injury. I would say that decades of work on your behalf are what have brought us to this point. So I want to really thank you for that work. Um, thanks for coming. Also, I'm really pleased to say that, I hope you don't mind, uh, Kevin and Joyce, Lucy are here, and for me, getting to know Kevin and Joyce has been really a motivating factor in wanting to continue this work. And I've been incredibly honored and privileged to get to know them personally and learn of their son, Jeff Lucy, and they were an inspiration for us to have a support group for military families, and their advocacy on the behalf of veterans has been sort of mind-boggling. So I know they have to duck out a little early, you won't be able to catch them at the end, but I do want to acknowledge their incredible outreach to prevent further military suicides. Um, then I also want to say a little bit, very, very briefly, because um, we have so many speakers, about the Veterans Education Project, which has been going for over 30 years. And in all the conversations leading up to this event tonight, it occurred to me that in many ways, the very existence of the Veterans Education Project has been the accumulation of a number of Vietnam veterans in particular, but veterans from other eras as well, struggling to come to terms with and find some resolution for a very wide range of moral injuries. And I have been quite privileged to personally witness, I've been here for 12 years, Rob Wilson, our past director, was here for more than 20 years, and both of us have witnessed so many veterans when there was no language, when nobody even talked about PTSD, never mind moral injury, and everyone coming back had their own stories and their own confusions and their own conflicts and has struggled through incredible, I mean, it occurred to me after I'd worked with VP a few years, you know, so many of our veterans happen to work in sort of healing professions in some way, whether it's working with the land or working in nursing, why is that? And so many veterans came to me with personal stories, whether it was the importance of sharing the truth of their experience, or going to a church community, um, or working with young people, or working with the, the farming communities, but finding something that had some, uh, I don't know, healing is not really the word I want to use, but some antidote perhaps for a difficult, uh, extremely difficult experience in war that our community was not really providing any kind of forum for working through. Um, so that's all I'm really going to say tonight. I'm going to turn it over next to um, New Hampshire College humanities professor Bob Mahar, who has really, I have to say, so many of our events would never have happened for over the last 10 years without Bob. He comes to us and he says, have you heard of so-and-so and have you read this? And he just brings us up to date. On, you know, we're, we're a small organization, we're spread pretty thin, and Bob comes to us and says, I really think this is a good event. And we're like, great! 
<laughs> and he, he makes it happen. So it's just amazing. I mean, we, we all work together, but I just want to say that Bob has been an incredible inspiration of a, a civilian who cares very deeply about these issues, thinks deeply about them, and figures out a way to, to pull off events like this uh, and, and weave it together. Um, Bob has published many books. He has a book coming out this coming fall called Killing from the Inside Out, Moral Injury and Just War. Um, so he'll, he'll, int he'll introduce the, the night and then the other speakers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very warmly. Um, before I begin, I want to point out one other person very important in our community here who is, who is here this evening. It's Roger Johnson, the director of our own Western Massachusetts VA hospital in Leeds. And I, I will add, you know, that it, we have, as some of you certainly know and others may not, we have a very, I think a very special, extraordinary VA hospital here. Um, and um, I've been involved in various programs there for the last six years and gotten to know a number of the staff um, and David very, very well. And it's truly a remarkable, remarkable group of highly, highly dedicated people trying to help our veterans. In 1915, six months after the outbreak of World War I, Sigmund Freud offered this less than prescient comment in an essay entitled Thoughts for the Times on War and Death. When the fierce struggle of this war will have reached a decision, every victorious warrior will joyfully and without delay return home to his wife and children, undisturbed by thoughts of the enemy he has killed at close quarters or with weapons operating at a distance. What would assure so untroubled a homecoming for the veterans of the Great War, as Freud saw it, was the happy fact that they, like all civilized men, as he called them, had lost their ethical delicacy of feeling. Savage men, he explained, lived in fear of the men they murdered, of their lingering vengeful spirits, that is, whereas modern men knew better than to allow the past to haunt them. To their credit and to their agony, however, Freud underestimated the consciences of the men and women who returned from the trenches and the killing fields of the Great War and of every war since. What they saw and suffered and especially what they did in war came home with them and darkened the remainder of their days. It is in that same darkness that we gather here this evening after a century of wars in search of some light. The truth that escaped Freud, and from which so many veterans are unable to escape, is that the awful work of war, the cleavage of humanity into enemy camps, and the slaughter that follows diminish, distort, and darken us, all of us. It should make you shake and sweat, writes Sergeant Brian Turner, a former infantry team leader in Iraq and the most notable poet yet to emerge from that war. It should make you shake and sweat, he writes, nightmare you, strand you in a desert of irrevocable desolation, the consequences seared into the vein, no matter what adrenaline feeds the muscle into your courage, it feeds the muscle its courage, no matter what God shines down on you, no matter what crackling pain and anger you carry in your fists, my friend, it should break your heart to kill. And it does. What happens when our boys kill, right, writes former Marine Captain and Iraq veteran Tyler Boudreau. No matter, he writes, how well we desensitize them, no matter how just the cause, the violence they inflict in battle will seep into their souls and cause pain. Even in self-defense, killing hurts the killer too. In war contrary to the sanguine illusions of Freud, the killed go dark in death, and the killers go dark in life. This is what we have come to call moral injury. 
the violation by oneself or another of a personally embedded moral code or value resulting in deep injury to the psyche or soul. It is what used to be called sin. The haunting question here is how can there be moral injury in a just war? The traditional and mostly unquestioned answer is that there can't be. The idea that dutiful service to one's country in a just war can be simply wrong, putting at risk one's humanity and very soul is blasphemous and unthinkable to nearly everyone except those who have experienced it to be the case. It is an idea that many or most veterans are unwilling to express, for they know the anger and resentment they will provoke with their words. Timothy Kudo, our focal speaker and guest tonight, a Marine captain who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, learned this when he submitted a piece to the Washington Post in January 2013 entitled, I Killed People in Afghanistan, Was I Right or Wrong? To many, the question was indeed blasphemous, and his answer to it proved still worse. Killing is always wrong, but in war, it is necessary. This simple statement, killing is always wrong, calls radically into question, none too soon, I believe, a theory and doctrine firmly in place within Western ethical and theological orthodoxy for the past 1,500 years. I have in mind here what we know of, what we know as the just war doctrine. The deceptive and destructive core of the Christian just war doctrine can be stated very simply. It is the claim that wars, or at least some wars, and all the killing and destruction they entail are, in addition to being necessary, good and right, even virtuous and meritorious, pleasing in the sight of God. This calls for a new species or category of homicide, killing that is radically distinct from murder, a distinction that hadn't previously existed in Christian ethics. Murder violates the will of God and darkens the soul of the murderer, but the other new kind of killing doesn't. The difference lies not in the level of violence, death, suffering, and destruction involved, but in the intention of the killer. If the intention is to do the will of God, which the tradition identifies as the will of the church and its ordained spokesman, or else the will of a legitimate, legal, sovereign authority, and if all that is done is done with love, or at least not in hate, then there can be no moral injury because there has been no moral infraction. If the intention is pure, all is well in heaven, and so all is well on earth. The origin of this foundational claim lay not in the New Testament, nor in early Christian theology and practice, but rather in a practical necessity and political convenience. Once the Christian church found itself in a position of power, which is to say that once the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire, the exercise of lethal force and the waging of war, that is killing, became its ecclesiastical responsibility. In fact, service in the army, the imperial legions, was confined to baptized Christians. How then could the Christian church say that military service was sinful? How could it maintain and deploy an army of Christians whose very service put their souls at peril? A pacifist church was one thing. A pacifist empire was another. It was untenable. Augustine and his mentor Ambrose, both of whom had once aspired to a secular career in the imperial service, came up with a solution, a new theory of war and killing that would not only permit, but endorse killing for God and country, as it were. It was from the beginning a doctrine of convenience, conceived, promulgated, and per perpetuated by men who themselves as clerics, men of God, men of the cloth, would personally eschew service in the military and the conduct of war. They and their successors in the tradition would readily raise a hand to bless the troops, but never themselves lift a hand to wield a sword or carry a rifle. There would be no blood on their hands. War and killing, now blessed, soon became not the lesser of two evils, but a positive good. Invented in a theological lab, just war and virtuous killing, as soon as they were tested in the field, 
proved useful for some and devastating to others. The others were the combatants, the killers and their victims. The shocking truth was that the side effects of just war on these unordained others were of little concern. Not even civilian casualties, however massive, were finally allowed to question its efficacy. Church and state were not about to condemn war any more than they are today, not, least, not at least their wars. So war had to be good, or rather our wars had to be good, and those who serve in them do no wrong, ever, so long as they serve the cause and follow orders. Every war is just from the perspective of those waging it, and every combatant is a hero to the side they are on. That is the wall our veterans still run up against today. They are expected to deny their own pain, ignore that war has, what war has taught them, and take up their civil status as heroes, the responsibility, in fact. As ex-Marine Lieutenant Carl Marlantes poignantly, poignantly relates, when he raised his right hand in 1964 and swore an oath to obey the Commander-in-Chief and signed up with the Marine Corps, he, in his own words, believed that a President of the United States would never give men an order that would cause any moral conflict. His service in Vietnam, where he won the Navy Cross, two Navy Commendation Medals, two Purple Hearts, and ten Air Medals, was marked with distinction. It also, by his own account, left him haunted. The Marine Corps taught me to kill, but it didn't teach me how to deal with killing. Several decades and several wars later, it seems the Marine Corps may not be doing significantly better in confronting this issue. In 2001, at the Navy and Marine Corps' annual conference on combat and operational stress control, moral injury was a, was a major focus of scrutiny and debate. One Marine commander on the panel, as reported in Stars and Stripes, objected to the very concept of moral injury, saying that, as a Marine, I am insulted. The implication that Marine training and honorable military service entail immoral behavior and thus lead to moral injury was more than this Marine and the Marine Corps more widely could accept and understandably so. And so the Marine Corps has said it prefers to speak of inner conflict rather than accept any implication of immorality in the work of war, which is, after all, what Marines train for and excel at. Where, we might ask, does this leave our veterans, many of whom, haunted by what they have witnessed and done in war, live in what some have described as an impenetrable darkness? If they fear that they have lost their souls or their humanity or both, it is not because they have committed war crimes, but because their own experience has led them to the conviction of the essential criminality of war. This is a conviction, however, that their grateful nation does not readily accept. Surely there cannot be guilt and shame in having done their duty, served their country at such great risk and cost to themselves. What haunts them, many say, must be in their heads, or more precisely, in their brains. And there are on offer perfectly good drugs to deal with that. From the beginning of the just war tradition, the powers that be needed their wars, and they enlisted their heroes to wage them. Nothing about that has changed, including the confusion and resentment of the returning warrior at the reception he comes home to. It baffles him, writes Kevin Powers, an Iraq war veteran and author of the acclaimed novel, The Yellow Birds. It baffles him because he immediately remembers what he has actually done, the acts of violence for which he's being thanked, and it just doesn't make sense. And he doesn't get to hide from the fact that he must account for what he's done. The truth is that just war theory has never made sense to those with blood on their hands nor to those whose blood it was. But to our great shame, that fact has not been given much weight or mattered much and has been largely ignored. After all, veterans represent less than 1% of the population. The fact is that just war doctrine lies at the root of our inability, I believe, to comprehend moral injury 
and to make sense of our military heroes marching off to take their own lives. Why can't our veterans see themselves as we see them, luminous in their service, and lucky to have the rest of their lives ahead of them? Why can't they leave the war behind? The truth, of course, is that warriors bring their war home with them, not like a tan acquired on holiday, but like a secret they wish they hadn't been told. It is a secret the rest of us need to learn, even if, we, even if we'd rather not. And a part of that secret is that, in the words of Captain Kudo, killing is always wrong. I, for one, am grateful, deeply grateful to him for summoning the courage to remind us all of this most inconvenient truth, and especially to join us here this evening. Please warmly welcome Timothy Kudo. Maybe this is going to ingest. Hi. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, when I first got back from Afghanistan, uh, I went to a bar, as most people do when they come back from a war zone. And I walked in, I was randomly talking to a person that was there, and I mentioned that I just got back, I was in the Marine Corps, and they asked me if I'd killed anyone. And so I wasn't really ready for that question, but I kind of understood to a certain degree where it came from. Because <clears throat> when I was a civilian, before I joined the military, that was one of the big questions that I had and that I would have wanted to know, I think, if I had, had the opportunity to talk to a soldier or Marine. Um, but I also didn't know how to answer it. If I said yes, you know, what would he think of me? Would he think I was a killer, a murderer? Um, I, I didn't know. And he, I certainly wasn't going to tell him about the types of killings uh, that we had been a part of. And if I said no, you know, a Marine who hasn't killed, to some degree, isn't really a Marine. Um, that's not true, and you should know that's not true, but to a certain degree it feels like that. I was an infantryman, I was with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, and so we went over there to do that kind of thing. Um, and so it was tricky, it's like either I'm this killer or I'm not a man. And this is kind of the dilemma that I kind of dealt with um, internally. And I was pissed at the guy, I was really pissed at the guy, I had a little bit to drink and uh, you know, the interesting thing was is it wasn't the first time, I, or it wasn't the last time I got that question. I'd gotten that question many times since then, because people, people are curious, they want to ask. Um, and so what I've come to believe is that we need to start talking about these things a little bit. People need to understand. I think it's going to be helpful for the country if people understand. Um, and I think it's also going to be helpful for a lot of veterans who want to tell these stories but don't feel comfortable doing so. So one of the things I've come to realize is that right now the experiences of men and women in war are so completely divorced from anything else that we do that it's breaking up relationships. Fathers and sons can't talk to each other about their experiences. Husbands and wives can't talk to each other about it. Um, it's, it's ruining these relationships. And in a broader level, even more worrisome to me is that it's kind of breaking apart our country. Between those who've served in the military and those who haven't, this inability to talk about these issues and understand them is tearing that apart a little bit. It's dangerous, and I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail. It's dangerous when that happens because, to my mind, it makes more and more likely to happen. And whether you think that wars should happen in certain cases, whether it's Syria um, or other countries where we currently face several challenges, we want it to be a last resort, and it has to be a last resort. And if it's not, and we don't understand what goes on in these places, then it's not going to be a last resort, and we've seen that in the past decade. So tonight my hope is that we can discuss this a little bit, and when we get to the Q&A part, um, you know, I know a lot, there's a lot of veterans in the audience, there's a lot of uh, family members of veterans and people who've served. You know, I'm happy to answer any question that you have, no matter what it is. Um, I've come to learn that it's not as simple. Oh, thank you. It does work. Excellent. Perfect. Um, so I guess the lesson and kind of the focus of this talk is going to be that it's not as simple yes or no question, did you kill someone? And it's not even an important question. Because what's important is not whether or not you pulled the trigger, but what comes afterwards. And so that's what I hope to kind of discuss. So I want to start by talking about Afghanistan, because that's where my combat experience was. Um, I served in Iraq previously, um, but it was a pretty easy deployment. Nothing really happened. It was very, very calm. Um, my first day in Afghanistan, I went out on patrol to see the area that we were in. Um, about a mile out from our base, we found our first IED. We, got to, we dismantled it. We got to the second base, and a convoy passing us struck an IED, so we saw that go off. And then as we drove down the road again, we, we ourselves struck another IED, and the turret gunner in our lead vehicle flew out the turret because he didn't have his harness on, um, landed, and we had to medevac him. 
And uh, he lived, but he was, he was pretty bruised up. And this was a unit that was about a couple weeks from uh, getting back out. I was, I was there ahead of time. So this thing was real to me. Um, it was real to me immediately what was going on. But I also realized that this was something that I could, I could survive. You always kind of wonder what's going to happen when the first bomb goes off or when the first bullet gets shot at you. And you don't know how you're going to react. And so here it was, the first day. This had happened. And I reacted fine. I did what I was supposed to do. And I lived. And so to a certain degree, that gave me a sense of uh, invincibility. And I think a lot of guys get that kind of thing. Even though I had seen this guy get injured, to me it felt like I could get through this. About a week later, my unit had finally taken over. We had done our uh, relief in place with the previous unit. And I got a call on the radio at night, about midnight, and it was uh, one of my Marines at an outpost, and he saw a guy digging in an area that nobody should have any business digging at midnight. It was two guys, looked like they were digging a hole right on the road. They had what looked to be something with wires in it. Um, maybe, you know, they thought it was a bomb. They thought it was an improvised explosive device. And so they asked me, can I, can I shoot this guy? And so I looked at my commanding officer, and he looked back at me, like I was the one who was going to make this decision, which I wasn't expecting. Um, and I did, and I was like, yes, shoot him. And so they killed him. And it was at that moment that I realized that I could make a decision like that, that I could be responsible for killing another person. And it's, it flipped the switch a little bit. It made you realize that you were capable of doing all the things that you thought you trained to do, but that you didn't know that you were going to do. And from then on, it became a little bit like a game. We didn't lose our first Marine for a while. So day in, day out, we were going out, getting in firefights, dismantling IEDs, dealing with IEDs with um, our vehicles, and we were winning. We were doing pretty good. We were working with the villagers. We were doing a lot of good stuff, um, and we were dropping a lot of bombs on a lot of enemies, um, and we were killing them. And none of our guys were getting hurt, and it was great. And then one of our units, um, from the same unit actually that called me about the IED, got in a firefight and was pinned down, and one of the Marines got shot in the neck. And I got the call on the radio to get his medevac out. And I still remember his sergeant and the, the tone in his voice was a tone I had never heard before. And it, was, um, it was just fear. It was just pure fear. And he was doing everything that he had to do and he was doing his job. But you could tell that he was afraid. And it was a fear that I hadn't heard from guys in the units before. Guys who had been in a lot of firefights, had been dealing with IEDs. But one of his buddies was injured. And he was going to die. And he did die on the helicopter out. So, to me, that made it, that made it real. Um, like I said, it wasn't real before, and that was what made it real for me, was losing the first guy. So I understood what we were getting into, I understood what was going on, and we kept doing our patrols, we kept doing what we were gonna do, and one day, I went out on patrol with the men. Um, even though I was an executive officer, I was uh, second in command of the company, um, and so I spent a lot of my time behind a desk, frankly, and behind a computer. You try and get out with the guys, you try and go see the bases, you try and make sure that guys are doing what they need to do, and they, they know that you're out there with them. So I go on patrol, and we go and we're crossing a riverbed. And as I'm crossing this riverbed, we're looking across and we see a farmer, and he drops his little dowel, and he just starts running for his life. And so we're like, oh shit. Like, this is about to happen. Something's about to happen. And immediately, machine gun starts firing over our heads. So we dive to the ground. We finally get across the uh, riverbed. We don't know really where this thing is coming from. We know generally where the machine gun is coming from. But now there's like bullets. People are shooting us from behind and from other places. We had no idea really what was going on. Our radio stopped working, which is exactly what you want to have happen at a time like that. And we finally get to this place where we're kind of in a house. Or not in a house, but like we've, we're surrounded by houses. And so even though rounds are hitting the house, there's a, bear, a berm that's covering us. Um, and so we're safe. I mean, as lo even though bullets are being shot at you, you're, you're safe because you're behind some cover. Um, and so we had some time to plan and think. And we figured out that the enemy was in this small little, little building, basically, about two or 300 meters away from us. And so I asked if we could just destroy it with a, with a missile, frankly. Um, and we, we weren't allowed to do that because we didn't want to kind of use too much force in Afghanistan. And so we said, okay, that's fine. I understand that. We don't want to, there to be uh, innocent people killed. We're going to assault it on foot. So we set up a little firing position, and two of our guys went to go assault this building. And while this happened, we're there. We're, we're kind of looking out. The shooting's kind of stopped, it seems, um, or it's intermittent. And these two guys on a motorcycle come over this hill that's right near us. And they come up to the top of the hill, and they stop. And one of my Marines sees him, and he says, sir, I think, I think those guys are shooting at us. I'm like, 
are you sure? Can you see a weapon? Do you see, you know, gunfire, anything? They're like, I, I don't know. So I was like, we'll look through your scope and check it out. He couldn't tell. So I was like, go wave them, wave them off. Tell them to wave off. Tell them to go a different direction. And they just come closer. So now he's really worried. And the other Marines are now starting to get worried. And so um, I tell him, you know, go fire a smoke grenade at him. A smoke grenade that'll, you know, tell him, hey, get away from here. Get away from here. And we do that. And he's still, the, these two guys on this motorcycle still don't stop. So they keep coming. Um, and we basically do all the things that we're trained to do when you don't know what someone's intentions are. You, you kind of give them all these warnings to kind of pull the intentions out of them. And uh, we did this. And they still kept coming. So at this point, the Marines are getting nervous. You shot a smoke grenade at this guy. You yelled at him to run away. Um, they fired a warning shot um, near him, uh, to the side of him, with a tracer so they could see the, the round shooting towards them. Um, and they're still coming towards us. They stop. And at that point, there's machine gun fire from, from a direction. And nobody can really tell where it is, but the Marines think that it's these guys that have shot at us, so they shoot at them. And in war, you have the right to self-defense. So if someone's shooting at you, you don't have to be told to shoot. You don't have to ask permission to shoot. You can shoot. And you're within your rights of self-defense to do that. So that's what they did. And they were right to do that. So the rounds hit the motorcycle. The motorcycle sparks. The two men on, the, on it are, are dead immediately. There's no one in the building that we assaulted where we thought the machine gun fire was coming from. All the gunfire stops. So we go to the, the motorcycle, which is now laying on the ground. The two guys are dead next to it. Um, one of the guys is about 16 years old. The other guy is maybe 20. I think they were brothers. And it turns out that they were trying to get to their house, which is actually the house that we were taking cover from. And so their entire family is inside the house. And their entire family saw them get shot. And their entire family comes outside to collect the bodies. And the women are screaming. Uh, the men are crying. Um, they gather the bodies. They gather the motorcycles. And they go back. And they take them for a Muslim burial, which has to happen before sunset. So when we were walking to the motorcycle, the Marine who shot him, I remember him muttering under his breath, please let them have weapons. And they did not have any weapons. What they actually had were sticks and bindles, like you'd see in the old movies, where like a hobo would have something. Um, and he thought that was a weapon. And it turned out that the glint of the sun off the motorcycle engine was what he thought were gunfire, was gunfire. So they died. We got on the radio. Um, I got on the radio immediately. I told my CO what had happened. And I told him, hey, look, we did everything right. I told him exactly what to do. And, but this is what happened. We're going to have to deal with this. Um, later on, a few days later, we had to meet with the family again to pay them restitution, which is what you do in Afghanistan. But clearly, no amount of money can, can fix that kind of situation. Uh, when we got back from Afghanistan, the uh, first week we were back, we had a memorial. Our unit lost five Marines. And we had the photos of each of them on stage. And we had an entire battalion of about 1,000 people in an auditorium, everyone standing at the position of attention. And first, each member of the family of each of those Marines goes on stage to pay their respects. And then each Marine, in turn, goes and follows them to pay their respects to each person um, that was killed. And one of my good friends, who is a platoon sergeant, which is rare to lose someone who's a staff sergeant um, in combat these days, uh, he had gotten blown up. He stepped on an IED. Um, or an IED was actually triggered and killed him instantly. Uh, she collapsed on stage, crying, sobbing uncontrollably for five, ten minutes. Couldn't move. And so it's a thousand Marines just watching her. Watching her break down, cry. Marines who were in his unit, Marines who couldn't help this guy. One of the Marines who was killed actually had a twin brother, an identical twin brother. So as we were there, here's this Marine who looks exactly like the Marine who died, almost like a ghost. And then we all walk through, and it's done. And I got out about a month later, and I never saw most of those guys again. But even though we lost five Marines in Afghanistan, um, about a year later, we lost another one to suicide. And those two things are not unrelated. So now we have six Marines that are lost from that deployment, from my company alone. So going to war is difficult, obviously. Um, and it's difficult where we are right now in Afghanistan, um, where we still are, even though you don't read about it many, that often. But the experience isn't unique to Afghanistan, and it's not unique to now, and it's not unique to the Marine Corps. And I know there's a lot of veterans here. Some of them have probably had similar stories. Um, but since I wrote the story in the Washington Post, I received a lot of emails. So I just want to read a few quick snippets from them of people who felt that what I had written resonated with them. Um, from one Vietnam veteran, he wrote, 
Before I boarded one of the last helicopters of the, of the embassy, I guarded, I guarded a portion of the embassy complex walls. A Vietnamese man tried to get his daughters into the compound. Push came to shove, and I hit him in the head with a nightstick. I still remember the sound of Oak hitting head, the look on his face and his daughters as he sank to the ground. Was I right or wrong? Were my actions justified? An Afghan who had been in Afghanistan before the uh, American invasion, but after the Russians, so he had been through some pretty serious stuff there, wrote, the grief of a soldier's mother is still grief, just as the grief of the mother of that 16-year-old motorcyclist. And another man summed it up. Perhaps the worst day of my life is when my daughter asked me, Daddy, have you ever killed anyone? It didn't get any better when my son was older and curious enough to ask the same question. Perhaps this is part of the sacrifice veterans carry in defense of their country. So we have to ask ourselves why this is difficult. Why isn't it simply, I went over there, I did my duty, and I came back? Because um, there's a lot of that's been written, as we talked about earlier, um, on just war theory and other things. So I want to talk a little bit right now about what I thought beforehand when I went over there and why I thought killing was okay and what I went through in terms of that thought process. And then when I came back, why that changed and why some of those beliefs didn't work at the end. So the first one was just war theory. Um, and kind of World War II is almost the prototypical one, right? You got the Nazis, they're killing everyone in Europe through genocide. You go over there and you have to stop them. And to me, this described a lot of what was going on in Afghanistan with the Taliban. You had the Taliban who were horrible, who were doing terrible things to women and to villages there, and they need to be stopped. And I do believe they need to be stopped. And at some level, you have to believe that it's morally right to kill another person. You have to believe that they're less than you, morally, because they're, they're evil in some way. Um, and I also think that as an extension of that, collateral damage has to be acceptable too. That even though we're going to do this terrible thing to this country, it's worth it in the end. It's just in the end. No matter how many people die, no matter how many civilians die, or enemy combatants die, because the other, the other option is going to be worse. The other thing I came to realize is that there's a dehumanizing of the enemy um, that's effective in two ways. On the first is the just war theory dehumanization, which is these people are wrong, they're evil, and they need to be killed. But on the other hand, in America or anywhere really, there's a dehumanization that's um, less noble. Uh, our snipers used to call the, te the Afghans that they killed subhumans. And this is not an uncommon thing in, in the Marine Corps or other places too. Um, and there's a dehumanization, in whether they call people in the Middle East ragheads or hajis or anything like that. Um, dehumanizing the enemy, whether it's racial or ethical, um, can be necessary at times to get yourself into a position mentally where you can kill people. Another thing is, there was a difference between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. And this, again, was touched on in this idea that, look, if you're killing an enemy combatant, it's not, it's not murder, it's not homicide, it's something entirely different. I also, I think for myself, the most obvious one was I rationalized that these enemy fighters, they, they chose to pick up a weapon and fight me. I mean, yes, I'm in their country. Yes, I'm shooting at them maybe first sometimes, but the reality is, is that if you didn't want to get shot at, you didn't have to pick up a weapon. And to me, it felt like there was a, a man fighting a man almost in a brawl kind of aspect to it. Um, and I think a lot of Marines kind of take that ethos as well, that if you don't want to get shot, you shouldn't pick up a gun. Um, and finally, well, I think those are kind of the big things. For me, this, the dehumanizing part wasn't as big one, but the idea that they could pick up a weapon um, and come at me was a big one for me. So I thought those things going in, and then we went over there and we had that deployment, and they didn't really turn out to be as true as I thought they were going to be. For just war, you know, We've lived in an era that's very, with very politicized wars, much like Vietnam was. And you know, recently it's been that Iraq is the bad war and Afghanistan is the good war. I mean, I don't know if, which one is good or which one is bad. Um, but if the only justification for you fighting and killing in a war is that you win, then what happens to every war that we lose in or, or stalemate at? And I also don't know if that necessarily fixes it for you internally. Even the veterans who fought in World War II, which is supposedly you know, the, the good war, the just war, the most just war we've ever fought, you still face things that that kind of rationalization just really doesn't work with. The second thing is killing versus murdering may give solace to some people who are legal scholars, but to me it does nothing. The idea that, oh, the Bible says one thing and that's not really what you did, or that a bunch of priests in a, you know, a back room kind of figured this out, it doesn't help with what you feel, and you feel like a murderer sometimes when you're doing these things. And even if killing versus murdering, there is a distinction, 
In my particular case, we definitely killed people who weren't enemy combatants. So there is no question about the fact that this was not the same as just killing. Additionally, when you're over there in war, I think this goes to the civilian idea of killing versus murdering. We were killing with intent. We wanted to kill the Taliban. And body count was something that we aspired to because we felt that every Taliban that we killed um, made the villages safer and made the people there safer, made us more likely to win. And so the idea that you know, killing is a little bit more like manslaughter, whereas murdering has a little bit more intent, we went over there with intent. We went over there to kill people um, on purpose. So I really didn't buy that at the end. Additionally, when you see people that you killed, the dehumanizing aspect of it kind of goes away. When you kill them and you see that they're as young as 16, and I had been a teacher before I was in the Marine Corps, so they were the ages of what many of my students were at the time that I was over there. Um, you realize that's not really, they're not these inhuman people. You also realize you, you meet their families, you meet their fathers and mothers, and so you realize that you know, they're just like us. And you also come to realize, I think, in talking with them that they don't understand why we're fighting over there. They don't understand why we think the Taliban is bad, or what Al-Qaeda is, or what 9-11 was. They're just farmers protecting their land, and they think we're there to take it just like the Russians were. And so when you realize that, and that they're just there kind of protecting their turf, and they're playing self-defense, and you're playing self-defense, all that moral legitimacy just kind of goes out the window. Finally, on a practical level, when you kill a non-combatant, nobody celebrates with you. When you kill the bad guy, and we killed a couple bad guys who were planning IEDs, and it was clear they were planning IEDs, and we shot a missile at them, and we had the whole thing on camera and video, people, people cheered. People in the unit cheered. And we had lost a Marine earlier that day, so there was kind of like a revenge aspect to it. When you kill a non-combatant, nobody wants anything to do with it. Nobody wants anything to do with you. There's reports to file. There's legal investigations. Everything about it makes you feel like you did the wrong thing. So whether you did or not, that's how it feels. So, We've kind of gotten to the point of what is moral injury. And when I was in Afghanistan and these things happened, I didn't, I didn't dwell on the issues. I went about my business because I had stuff to do every single day. I had men under me. I needed to set an example for them. We need to get through this. We need to get back home. We need to make sure we didn't lose any more Marines. But as I've come back, I'm a grad student now. So that's pretty much all I have time to do is think about stuff like this. Um, you come to realize that the morality that you went over there with, the kind of fundamental morality, doesn't really work. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about this because we're going to talk about religious aspects of this, I think, more tonight. But to me, there's kind of two types of morality, right? And he mentioned that I thought that killing was wrong but also necessary. The idea that killing is wrong, I, I fundamentally believe. And even if it's not wrong, it's hard to argue that you should kill other people, that there's some kind of mandate um, that killing other people is right in some way. That just seems to go totally against the idea of morality and ethics to me. And so really, the utilitarian idea, the idea that we have to do this because in the end, the ends will justify the means, is really the only way that I can justify the things that we've done over there, or the things that I did. Um, but what happens then when you lose? What happens when you don't win the war, or you don't win the war in your area, or at the end of the day, the things that you had to do don't necessarily reconcile pluses and minus, minuses to give you the right, the right answer? Um, and that's kind of the deal that we're faced with right now. So I chose to join the military. I chose to deploy, and I'm not in no way a conscientious objector. Um, I do believe that there are times when we have to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. And that's why I went to Iraq, and that's why I went to Afghanistan. And the reality, though, is that if the ends do have to justify the means, we certainly can't say we've done that in Iraq. We probably can't say that we've done that in Afghanistan. And like I said, even if we did do that in World War II, that brings a little solace to people who had to do terrible things to make that happen. So I'm left with a conviction that war is both wrong and necessary. And I know that these two things completely fight each other, that there's no way to hold these two beliefs simultaneously. And because I do hold these two beliefs simultaneously, this is the inherent nature, I think, of the moral injury that we've kind of been talking about. Now, I don't like the term moral injury. I don't, I don't like it for several reasons. First off, there's no fault in moral injury. If you're injured, you didn't do anything, right? Like the bomb went off next to you, you lost a leg, you're injured. The, the injury I face, if you want to call it that, or the moral issues I face are moral issues of my own deciding, of my own actions. And I'm responsible. I'm a responsible person. I knew what I was doing. It turned out badly, but I made those choices, and no one else is to blame but me for those actions. So 
calling it an injury in that sense is, is not necessarily helpful. Additionally, you know, if you're injured, can you get well in this kind of sense when it's maybe psychological? And I don't like the idea of necessarily being you know, labeled as morally injured for life, so I don't really ascribe to that. I would also say that when it comes to issues like PTSD, where we've talked about invisible injuries, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, PTSD is a case where there's a cycle, uh, actual physiological problem. You have a stress reaction. You have endorphins and you have adrenaline. You have all these things that trigger your body at the wrong time. And that creates a whole bunch of psychological reactions that are wrong or that you shouldn't be doing at the time that you're doing it. Moral injury or the moral conflict that we deal with, it has psychological symptoms, depression, if you will, um, sleeplessness, all these things that you can maybe treat with medication as the Marine that he quoted mentioned. But even if you treated all the symptoms, I still did what I did. And the moral conflict and the moral contradiction still remains. And I can't go back and change what's happened in the past. So looking at it as an injury or a physical symptomatic thing or something like PTSD, it, it is fundamentally different. And we have to figure out a way to kind of address it knowing that's the case. But just because I don't like the term, there are real implications to, for this kind of moral conflict. So I want to talk about a couple of them. First, um, having experienced war, morality means very different things to me than it does for a lot of you, I'm sure. Um, for me, you have to have really severe, permanent, and enduring human harm, um, harm that really can't be forgiven in some way. And it can't be the kind of thing when we think of ethics where it's a dilemma, where I'm looking at two choices. Oh, I'm sorry, where it's like, I want to do this thing, but it's really hard to do it, and I don't know if I should do the right thing. Real moral problems are dilemmas. There's no right answer. You're screwed if you do. You're screwed if you don't. And so part of the problem with this is having killed people, having dealt with human life issues, when I come back into society and I see how the rest of the people prioritize ethical issues, it becomes challenging for me. And I went and I looked at the New York Times and it has a Sunday column called The Ethicist, which kind of is, you know, it's a touchstone of our culture and it has these questions that The Ethicist answers each, each week. And I thought about my experiences in war and the ethical issues I deal with and I looked at some of the topics that he has and he's got things like whether I can download movies from the internet, um, is it okay to watch Woody Allen movies? Should baseball players be allowed to use steroids? And should we protect the wild horses? And you know, these are all these are fine things, and these are fine things to debate. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but to me, given my experience, I just don't care. I really don't care. And it speaks to a, to me at least, a culture that is superficial. In the same way that the Kardashians and all these things that we see on TV are superficial, our approach to ethics and real fundamental moral problems is just completely superficial. Um, but I think there's a positive side to it too, and one of the letters I got kind of spoke to this. He said, I do often wonder what I would have been like had I not been hardened by my experiences. I think the experiences did allow me to make difficult decisions later in life, but one always wonders if there might have been other decisions more worth considering than those made if the hardened views had not been there. I am, I am a good moral decision maker because I understand these issues. Whether I'm going to be put in a position again to take advantage of these skills and use them in a correct way, I don't know. But that change in perspective is valuable, as much as it can be harmful. So let's talk about that. The change in perspective can go very, very badly, too. Um, people talk about war as hell, as if that justifies any action in war. And shortly after I left Afghanistan, the unit that replaced my unit in the exact location that my unit was in decided to urinate on the corpses of several Taliban members that they had killed. Now, these, are, these were Taliban. There's no question that they were enemy fighters. You don't do that. You don't do that for a lot of reasons. First off, when it's on video and Al-Qaeda can use that and ta the Taliban can use that as a recruiting tool, I mean, it's just tactically stupid. But also, ethically, when you've killed the enemy, it's done. You've done what you had to do, and it's over. And they didn't recognize that. And so, as they go into this gray area, as you can go into this gray area ethically, it can be easy to go a little bit far to the extreme as well. And so we have to be careful of that. And that can happen here in the civilian world, too. I don't know what happens when in the news recently, there's been a, like a case of a, you know, the army guy shooting people and whatnot. I'm not saying it's tied to this, but I think people come back and it becomes very difficult to readjust their morality to what's expected of you. Um, we talked about the psychological symptoms. So the fourth, maybe worst part of it is, is when it comes to self-worth. If I'm not as good a person as I was, then how can I be loved? You know, how can I go, my girlfriend says she loves me. Does she know me? Does she know what I've done? How can she love someone who's done these things? Should you love someone that's done these things? This becomes a very tricky thing. Um, Non-religious ethics doesn't provide many good ways of regaining your ethical worth. 
right? So if you're religious and you go, you're Catholic, let's say, you go to confession, in theory you do your confession and you're kind of absolved and you're good again, right? And each religion has different methods of absolution or penance. Normal ethics, just common everyday ethics, doesn't really have that. And so for me, the kind of only way that you could do it is through forgiveness. But the people that could forgive me are dead, so they can't forgive me. And even if their families could, they probably won't. So there's no way that I can get forgiveness that way. The other option is I can maybe get redeemed by doing service, by doing good in the world, by saving lives. But I kind of view ethics as discrete rather than continuous. You don't get to like, you know, you save two lives and that allows you to kill one person or vice versa, right? So nothing I do in the future, no matter how good the rest of my life is, no matter how valuable or worthwhile, doesn't bring that back. So the other option is punishment, right? And how do you punish yourself if the sin you've committed is murder? And I think when we face issues with suicide and things like this, I think that's part of the calculus. And it's horrible, but I don't know how we get out of this. I don't know how you regain your self-worth. I don't know what you do to get out of that, given this contradiction that we have. So this is a challenge. So these are the things that I've gone through and that some veterans go through. But I will also say that many veterans don't go through these issues at all. There are plenty of veterans who kill and do their things overseas and they come back and they're fine. And there are people that I killed, enemy combatants who I know are bad people, that I feel nothing about. Now, I still think it's wrong what I did, but I don't feel that way. Totally fine with it. And frankly, if I hadn't have killed these people on this motorcycle, I probably wouldn't be standing here or even thinking about this that much. So we can't pick and choose what affects us in this way, but it is a real thing for a lot of veterans and it has and can have tremendous consequences. So I once wrote that civilians can't shoulder the responsibility for killing, but the social contract demands they care for those who do. And I think it's important to understand what this means, that when veterans go to war and they come back, we do have an obligation to them. And there are many people, including many veterans, that are upset by the fact that civilians don't understand what it's like, what it's like over there. They don't understand what they've gone through. Um, and I agree that this disconnect, like I said, is very unhealthy for our country, our foreign policy, and for the veterans who returned. But at the same time, we want to protect our family. We went over there because we didn't want our parents to have to go over there, or our kids to have to go over there. Right? I don't want my mom to know what happened. I don't want her to see that kind of stuff. And so there's a, there's a tension there between wanting to protect and yet maybe needing to tell people what happened and maybe lose a little bit of that innocence. And that tension is difficult to kind of get through. And so when we have these issues with veterans not willing to talk about this, I think in part that's a little bit of it. But it also creates a moral hazard because civilians benefit from us going overseas and yet they face none of the, none of the downside from it, none of the consequences of it. And so if civilians make the decisions about who and when we go to war, and veterans are increasingly a smaller part of this population and we bear all the negative downside, it worries me that we're more and more likely to go to war over time. So what, like, what can you do? You know, There's kind of two aspects to it. First is the government side and we have the VA here to talk about it and there's programs out here, um, vet centers and things like that that are doing great work and you need to be conscientious about that. There's, we, we weren't always doing well at the VA and so we've gotten to the point that I think we're trying to pick it up a little bit but this is a problem and you need to be, as citizens, kind of conscientious about that. But the second thing is cultural. Like, you're not gonna be able to help the anonymous veteran. I mean, you can send socks or whatever you wanna send as a care package or write a letter, or you can buy them a beer at a bar, and you should by all means do that. <laughs> but, you know, for the anonymous guy that you see in a uniform, there really isn't anything you can do and you gotta accept that. But many of you know a veteran, okay? Many of you have a friend who's a veteran, a family member who's a veteran, and you do, I think, need to talk to them about these things, or at least give them the opportunity. And here's where it becomes challenging, and here's what I didn't realize until much later in time. In one of the letters I received, a guy wrote, and this is maybe the most insightful thing I've, I've yet to read, people who care about us, even those who might have been sympathetic, expect the memories to pass. How do you explain that years later, it's still with you every day? I met a guy recently who was a bomber pilot in Desert Storm. 20 years later, he has a nightmare every single night from Desert Storm. These things permeate our heart in a way that nothing in civilian life can. Perhaps that is a good thing. We want it to be done, and we want to put it in the past, and we want to move on. And most things that we deal with as civilians are like that. But I've dealt with friends who have tragedies before, rapes, terrible things, and it doesn't end. And it's difficult because you have to keep asking them about it and keep talking to, about it, talking to them about it, and you don't want to necessarily. You have, the, you have your life to live. 
but where the random tragedy, tragedy is different, even with our friends and family compared to the veteran, is that you have a social obligation to listen to us, frankly. There's a social contract at play there, that we went over there to do these things so that you could live your lives here, and you have to deal with it at some, at some level. Whether that's you individually, whether that's paying attention to what the government's doing for veterans, you have to do that. So I want to conclude by just kind of talking about two questions that I've been asked a lot. The first one is, would you do it again? Um, I would, but I only would do it because I wouldn't want someone else to have to do it. And I think that's one of the parts of sacrifice that veterans do, is that someone's going to have to do it at the end of the day. These problems don't go away. These wars don't go away. The bad people that are overseas, they don't go away without someone stopping them. And so, yeah, I would do it for that reason, because I think war is just a fundamental part of human nature, and there will always be wars, and there's going to have to be people who are going to step up and go over there and do that. And the second thing that I've been asked a lot is, what would you say to someone that's thinking about enlisting or commissioning? Um, and I've been asked by 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds who are thinking about doing this. And I guess my answer is this. You know, it's obviously something you have to figure out for yourself. But if the reason you're thinking about joining is because you want to get a Medal of Honor pinned around your neck or you want to be the hero, which I think is what a lot of young kids think about, and I know, in full honesty, that's what I thought. You know, you'd go over there and you'd have this blaze of glory and it would be amazing and you'd get all this esteem when you got back home and you'd be a hero. And what I've come to realize is that the reality is that the day that that soldier or Marine or sailor airman did the thing that got him the Medal of Honor or that award, that was probably the worst day of his life. Most of his buddies probably died that day. He probably went through hell. He probably got injured. It was probably the worst day of his life. And so if you're still willing to do that because you know that it's a service that needs to be done, that there are people who need people to fight for them, and that you're willing to fight for them, then yes, I think you should join. But you shouldn't join because you want to be a hero. Thank you. I'd just like to introduce our next two speakers, who won't be speaking simultaneously, but I'll, I'll introduce them both now. The first is, is David Whiteley, who served as an Army helicopter pilot, and then for the past 20 years has been a chaplain, and now head chaplain, at our VA hospital in Leeds. And um, our second speaker is Jim Monroe, who is the Dean of Christ Church Cathedral in Springfield. He served as a, as a Marine in Vietnam and was one of the, the founding fathers and remains one of the pillars of, uh, of the Veterans Education Project, which is celebrating its 30, 31, and a half. 31 and a half year this <laughs> evening. So first of all, please welcome David Whiteley. After you listen to Tim, can you appreciate what a uh, VA chaplain does in counseling? It is a very stressful, emotional thing. And uh, just listening to Tim uh, is kind of moving. I mean, after 20 years, it's very difficult to talk about the trauma of so many veterans over those years without getting emotional. So if I do, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, uh, th this is a very serious thing. I, I want to start off with one little story that has helped me tremendously in my work with veterans while I've been at the VA. It was 1973. I was right out of college. I was commissioned as an armor lieutenant, went through all the schools I uh, had to go through, and was assigned to uh, Charlie Troop 2nd to 17th Cav, 101st Airborne Division. Had just a couple of years before that, returned from Vietnam. There I was, non-combat veteran, uh, a section leader in charge of five air crews, half of which were seasoned combat veterans. The other half were, like myself, brand new into the unit. And I was shocked at the way these guys were living their lives. Uh, I had fully planned to just get right in there, to get moving, to do, to do my job, to be, you know, 
uh, gung ho and going there, and these guys were suicidal in the way they were living. Heavy drinking, uh, brawling. Uh, not a day went by that I didn't have a call from somebody's wife telling me that, uh, you know, Warrant Officer Smith was out, hadn't been in in three days. Um, spent most of my time going over to the stockade to get these guys out, had to go to the commanding general a time or two, on and on and on. And, and I was just shocked by this behavior. And I thought to myself, I, where have I been? You know, I was trying to be in the milieu and just could not quite get there. Those guys were excellent. They, they did their jobs. They would drink all night long and then show up and work all day. Never knew how they did that. Did, I had no idea what was going on there until I started working at the VA. Realized that I was looking at trauma being acted out. This is what we have. It's the same way with moral injury. We don't, I'm not a psychiatrist. We do not really, we're just beginning to formulate ideas about what uh, moral injury is. And if you take a look at the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, you can kind of see um, some differentiations going on there. There is a diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there is something in the back of the DSM that says something like spiritual religious problems. And it's under a big paragraph that says may be considered in the clinical setting. So it's not quite the same thing. Uh, and of course then moral injury is not even in the DSM for it all. Uh, so we're just beginning to, to try to see how this issue of moral injury really can be addressed. I was talking to uh, Scott Cornelius, who's in charge of our uh, post-traumatic stress inpatient ward over at the hospital, and he basically said, yeah, David, you know, we can, we can handle uh, post-traumatic stress, we can stabilize with pharmaceuticals, psychotherapy, but how do, you, how do you start to treat guilt and shame? How, how, do you, how do you grasp something in a modality to sort of do that, that, that kind of thing? Well, that's when I said to Scott, well, you know what, you've got, you got chaplains. I mean, I do know psychiatrists who, who have, have really, you know, you'll, you'll have a veteran, they'll come in and he'll talk about, you know, his soul being gone. And the psychiatrist doesn't believe in a soul. So there is that dilemma there. Well, enter chaplains, enter rabbis and priests and Protestant ministers to try to then take on uh, with this veteran uh, some way to walk with this individual uh, to try to, to reintegrate him or herself into some degree of normalcy. Two, two questions I want to answer, and then I guess we'll open it up, or, or Jim will get up here. One, the first question is, uh, has been asked me, give some real-world examples uh, in your daily counseling uh, that might reflect some sort of struggle with moral injury. First thing I want to say is not everybody, as Tim said, pointed out, seems to have a problem with moral injury. There are those who feel totally righteous in everything that uh, the, the, the military says do, they go do it, they're, they're char chargers, they don't think, and, and they don't seem to ever have any problem. That's debatable, but in their minds, uh, they seem to be quite okay with that. Other veterans who've seen combat, um, for whatever reason, don't seem to have any problem at all in that regard. They don't seem to. I remember a veteran 10 years ago or so, he was a Navy a sailor and he was a survivor of the USS Indianapolis. I don't know if any of you know that one, but uh, 1945, the Indianapolis was torpedoed, immediately sank, and 1,100 men went into the water. It was the worst shark attack in history. 1,100 went in, 300 came out. This soldier was on Ward 8, or this sailor was on Ward 8, and he talked to me on numerous occasions. And can anybody guess what his number one question was? Why me? Why me? Well, no, no, really. Why me? 
he would talk about walking, swimming up to somebody, one of his friends, and turning over the, the, the uh, flotation device and nothing below the flotation device. And he was in the water for numerous days. Why me? Oftentimes these soldiers, uh, these sailors and soldiers feel like that they are the less fortunate ones than those who did not make it. Because for the rest of their lives, they were cursed with this experience. There are three things that I have learned, and so has the, uh, the other chaplains, Father Bonneville, our Catholic priest, and Harry Volupus, our Greek Orthodox, and we have a rabbi, uh, Kevin Hale, who is with us too, that, that seem to get us in the front door with veterans. The first is our dedication and our commitment to safety. Safety and sanctuary. You really can't beat that Rogerian unconditional acceptance when they come in. Uh, there's a distance there. A lot of people don't even want to see the chaplain coming, and that's fine. We do not force ourselves on anybody, but we do what they what we're called perch. We'll perch in the corner, and our troops will come by and they'll look, and then they'll leave, and then they'll come by and they'll nod, and then they'll walk off and we'll nod back. Some of them will come by and say, uh, what, "Who are you?" and a uh, cha chaplain, and they'll leave. And sooner or later, when they feel safe, when they feel right, they may engage us in conversation. One good thing about the Catholic Church is the confessional booth. They feel like they can go in there and in the safety of the sanctuary then they can just pour it all out and if a if you could be a fly on the wall you could see the level of emotional outpouring when finally a sailor and a soldier begin to let out the pain. If you knew what I had done, you could understand why I could never be forgiven. If I heard that once, I've heard it hundreds of times. So I say usually to them, go ahead, let's hear it. And that's the second point. You've got to be courageous. If you're going to go with these individuals, you have got to be courageous in going there with them. Because what they say to you, you've got to be willing to accept whatever they decide they need to get out. And one of the worst things you can do is drop that jaw or act like you're shocked because then you've left the room and they probably have gone forever. Dr. Jonathan Shea, thank you very much. I have a quote from his book, Achilles in Vietnam. He puts it like this. To be trustworthy, a listener must be ready to experience some of the terror, grief, and rage that the victim did. This is one meaning, after all, of the word compassion. Courage, the ability to promote a sense of safety and sanctuary uh, in the midst of pain, and integrity, finally, integrity. Don't ever say, I know how you feel, if you don't. You get a combat veteran, if you say, I know how you feel, you probably have lost them immediately. The only other person that can say that is another combat veteran because we really do not know how they feel. That young 19-year-old PFC Marine who's standing at a checkpoint outside Baghdad and he has exactly 20 seconds to decide that careening van coming at him is a family or a bomb and he has to decide if he's going to engage that or he's going to save his buddies because that decision is going to live with that young man for the rest of his life who among us can say unless you're combat i know how you feel secondly don't ever say it's going to be all right because who are you to say that very thing. I had the very fortunate opportunity in 1995 to talk to a war, World War I Army aviator. He flew camels, soft with camels. Anybody know what those things are? The big, great, big, gigantic engines with little sticks and <laughs> paper for the rest of it. And this guy, totally deaf, almost blind, beginning signs of dementia, he was 93, I mean, you know, 
And he didn't want to talk to a chaplain. And so every day I came in, he didn't remember me. So every day I came back in. Finally, I told him, I said, you know, you know, John, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Army pilot myself. He brightened up. Then he said, yeah, I remember all my friends broke down, started crying. What, 80 years? 85 years? Crying uncontrollably for the memory of those that he lost that long ago. I know how you feel. It's going to be all right. These are things that we should clearly stay away from. So what are we going to do? Well, the VA can't possibly handle all the things that need to be done for these great individuals. So partnership is exactly what we're going to try and hope to do. Partnership uh, with people that can reach out and help. I know several of the pastors in here, and I know you have the total capabilities of doing this kind of thing. Uh, moral injury probably is a social, moral problem. So therefore, social, moral institutions should be the ones that reach out and try to embrace these people and help them walk the way of health and wholeness. The churches, the synagogues, the mosques, uh, the shamans, the, the, the people who can walk with these individuals, let them tell their story, let them tell their narrative, welcome them home with more than just thanks for your service, and these individuals will recover. Two stories. Uh, veterans are one of our greatest, by the way, resources. Uh, there was a 60 Minutes. Anybody see that 60 Minutes uh, on uh, Mike Catone? Uh, he was a uh, Iraqi uh, Green Beret, uh, and he uh, was a counter, working counterinsurgencies in Iraq, and he came back and he joined the Massachusetts Highway Patrol, and he saw a lot of similarities in Springfield on what was going on in some of these villages in, in Iraq, and so he went to his bosses and he said, I want to go into Springfield and I want to do some counterinsurgency work that I learned on active duty. He went in, he befriended the neighborhoods, he and his team, all, most of whom were veterans as well, he befriended uh, all of these communities and encouraged them to have a network where they could report drug uh, trafficking, uh, gang uh, violence, uh, and lo and behold, after about a year, the crime rate began to drop. It's going on now. It was so successful, it was a special issue on 60 Minutes. Uh, this was a veteran, combat veteran. This is the way he was working his way back to sanity. One last story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to do a funeral. Indigent Vietnam veteran. Nobody knew him. He didn't have anything. He died. If you one of the local funeral homes called me and said, Dave, would you come over and do a funeral? Uh, he's probably by himself. Uh, he has nothing. Uh, you can come whenever, you know, I'll be here to come. And I said, well, let's set a time, 2 o'clock. I said, would you put it out? He put it out. I went over to the funeral home. When I got there, there were bicycles and shopping carts all around the funeral home. And I went in and I looked around and there was a, there was a funeral home, they, they were full, the place was full. Homeless people, Northampton. Turns out this Vietnam veteran was in sobriety, he was in recovery, and he never owned anything, and he bicycled around, but everywhere he went, he tried to help one of these homeless people. And over the period of the years, he began to be known at that level of Northampton existence. People got up in line, they came up, they spoke one at a time, they, they talked about him like he was their hero. A couple of women came up and said, we tried to offer him sexual favors and he just wouldn't take them. Because <laughs> that was the kind of guy he was. An unknown, but yet one who worked his way back into, we'll call salvation if you don't mind, through his service to others. There's a program in town which I think we ought to uh, acknowledge. It's up and coming. It's called Cathedral in the Night. Uh, Stephanie Smith, Lutheran pastor, and Chris Carlisle, Episcopal 
rector came over and talked to me the other day and said, how can, how can we all come together and how can we uh, join hands uh, with you and Steve Connor, the veterans, uh, Northampton, and try to make things work? And boy, did I really feel good because you know what? The VA can't do it by ourselves, but we're willing to reach out in partnership to the community so that these most valued treasures of our country can stand with us once again. To go to Vietnam um, because I knew uh, that I would not be killed. I knew that I would not be injured. I knew that I would not be afraid. Um, I knew that I would um, not have to kill anyone. Um, I was going to take notes to write the best novel since Jack Kerouac. <laughs> I was going to really both experience it, but also observe it, and all would be well. So my first thought, which has already been articulated, is that I was unable to comprehend the reality of war before I experienced it. And as has been said, I don't think anyone can, and as has been said, that is a terrible problem. Because I ache for leaders, uh, locally, around the world, those who are making decisions that affect us all, somehow be able to understand the reality of war, the reality of combat, the reality of being wounded, the reality of taking a life, to know the effect that it has, what it does to the human spirit. The second part of my own story is that in Vietnam I was buffered from having to recalibrate my moral compass. My job in Vietnam was to sit in an underground bunker and work at a computer uh, to help a howitzer 10 miles away aim and fire a shell that would land 5 or 10 miles in another direction. And so I had no experience of what was happening at the howitzer and I had no experience of what was happening where the shell landed. There was a Doonesbury cartoon during the Vietnam War which showed two pilots in a B-52 dropping those huge 500 pound bombs and one pilot is saying to the other, hey, did you hear? The Knicks won by two last night. So these two pilots are talking about uh, a basketball game back in the world with no experience of what the bombs that they're dropping is doing on the ground. So I had a buffer until February 23, 1969, when it all changed. Uh, and as our unit was overrun, uh, and I was wounded by two grenades in a foxhole, and the fellow right beside me was uh, decapitated by one of those um, uh, grenades, then it all changed. And so I came home uh, with a sense of what it was like, although I wasn't able to articulate it, but it was in there, and an unconscious awareness that others didn't understand it, and also an unconsciousness in me, this is the second point, that uh, I still had the buffer, and that I needed the buffer, uh, and that I carried it with me for many years. And, you all know about uh, the buffers, the buffer of suicide, the buffer of drugs, the buffer of alcohol, uh, the buffer of violence, uh, the buffer of uh, uh, many, many, many relationships. And the buffer that I picked um, was the buffer of being a really nice person, which works out well if you're an Episcopal priest. <laughs> <laughs> but I developed to a fine art um, the ability to be very, very nice to lots of people. Um, compassionate, caring, and loving uh, without allowing any individual to come across the wall uh, and get close. I'm 67 years old and it's only starting four years ago that that buffer has started to go down. So the second thought is that these buffers uh, that we build for protection and the fact that they don't last finally. And then the last thought to share has to do with healing. Um, I have been a, metro, met, a member of the Veterans Education Project for 30 years. I've watched my fellow and sister vets in this program, and some of you are here this evening, 
wrestle with all of the physical and the emotional injuries that, that we bring back. And I've watched some healing happen. And my sense finally is that healing is a profoundly uh, spiritual issue, not confined to any particular religion or, um, or worldview of any kind. Um, but Tim said, um, how do I know that I'm loved? And I see that question is at the absolute core of everything for our vets as well as for all of us. Um, how can I know that there really is unconditional love? How can I really know that I am loved just as I am? So I'm going to close with uh, a painting and a story. <coughs> This is not great art, but it's still quite a picture. Some of you know it. So here's a picture of a veteran uh, who's gone to the wall in Washington, D.C. He's coming home after work. He's got his jacket off, briefcase by his side, and his hand is up, touching the wall. And from inside the wall, um, a soldier uh, whose name is inscribed on the wall, one of the 58,200 and some names, is reaching out to touch him. And if you look closely, behind him are other figures. I think one is white, one's black, one's tan. Way in the back, I think one is a woman uh, to acknowledge all of those who were in Vietnam. When the wall was being constructed, people hated it. They said that it looked like a black gash in the ground. It looked like a grave. And they only started to be thankful of it when they saw that people were coming to the wall and having an experience of healing which is happening right here. That these man's, this man's tears, who knows how long they've been inside him, are coming out in the midst of the pain he's feeling at that moment. He is being healed. And I have a friend who fought in Vietnam and for 40 years was terrified to come to the wall for fear of the buffer coming down and what would come out. And finally, two years ago, he did go to the wall and it happened as he feared. It all came forth. And he counts that day as the first day, 40 years later, of his healing. And, and then uh, the story. Uh, about 15 years after I was in Vietnam, I went with a group of clergy to Africa. Our first night was in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. And no one told us that you're not supposed to walk in Uhuru Park. Swahili for Freedom, Freedom Park at night, kind of like New York's uh, Central Park in New York. So as we walked through the park, some Kenyan men jumped our group, um, and uh, it was a mugging in which uh, some people uh, were knocked down, wallets were stolen, and cameras, and then they ran off, and nobody was really hurt too badly. And we went back to our lodging. The next morning, walking through downtown uh, Nairobi, I was on the sidewalk when out of nowhere, a fear rose up inside of me that was so profound that a friend had to take me into a building and sit me down with my back to the wall in a small room and just be with me for a couple of hours. And I realized as I sat there that I was feeling the fear that I'd felt in the hospital in Da Nang when the shock wore off and was stunned to think that I had carried it right here for 15 years and didn't know it. That afternoon, we were going to visit a church outside of Nairobi in the country. And I got into a Land Rover and made sure that I had two big guys sitting on each side of me because it felt as though all of Africa was evil and crushing in on me and I had no way in which I could escape. We got to the church and I got out of the Land Rover and stood there. The church looked like a garage made out of concrete blocks, but out of it came the women's group of the church. They'd obviously been preparing for us because there were about 20 women dressed in beautiful clothes, bright colors, and they were singing and dancing and waving their arms and they started to walk towards us. 
And as they got closer, each woman started to come towards different ones of us. And one woman in particular headed towards me. And I was standing there frozen in this fear and unable to do anything about it. And as she got closer to me, I realized that this was a really big woman. <laughs> as she got closer, I saw that she must have been at least six foot six and that she was ample. She was not slender. And she had her arms open and she was beautiful and she was swaying and dancing and singing. And then she got even closer and completely invaded my personal space. <laughs> And she put her arms around me, and I kind of physically disappeared out of sight <laughs> into her. And I have no words, just as I don't have any words that could convey to someone who hasn't experienced it what it's like uh, to be blown up by a grenade, just as I think Tim uh, perhaps doesn't finally have the words to convey to someone who has not shot a bullet and killed somebody and then seen the body blown apart. What's that like? So I also have no words that can describe for you what happened to me as that woman embraced me. All I can say is that the fear that was freezing me melted away and fell off me just the way leaves fall off the trees here in the fall and was replaced by a kind of peace that I hadn't realized was possible. I hadn't expected this. I hadn't planned for it. I hadn't done anything to make it happen. It just came to me. Like a meteor that invades our space, uh, it came to me as an unbidden, unbelieved possible gift. I later learned she was one of three wives to a man, that she spoke no English, that she'd had 16 children, that she and I have nothing in common on an earthly plane. And I count her as one of the greatest gifts in my life. So, the healing for moral injury has something to do uh, with receiving an embrace like that. And there is the invitation for you and me in receiving that embrace to be those kinds of arms for those around us. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I know for me it's an amazing thing, even though I've heard Jim's story before, it still really sinks in and resonates. Um, and I'm going to say that I have seen, I would call that grace myself, I don't know what terms you would use, but I have seen different examples. There is, in my experience, no one answer. But I do have the belief I couldn't continue to do this work if I didn't have the belief that there was a possibility for each story that I hear to be met in some way with some form of grace. And I don't know the answers. And I don't have a particular, you need to go to this church or this community. But I've witnessed it in different ways. And one of the ways I've witnessed it is in people really sharing and being heard and being felt. And I've also seen what happens when that can't happen. And I'm just going to very briefly say some of the stories that I have heard that we fail currently in bringing to our community. And when a veteran experiences trauma, for whatever way, they've signed up to experience it on behalf of their community. But sometimes the community cannot hear or acknowledge those traumas. So I'll just very briefly say some of those traumas include things like, I was gang raped by my three sergeants. I've never told anybody. Some of these traumas include, I was in a secret force and I am not allowed to talk about things and so if an individual can only talk about something by becoming very, very, very drunk, it's very difficult to achieve that place of grace in the community if these stories can never be shared or acknowledged. And so it's been my heartbreak, honestly, 
to witness people who never receive that. And I know there are individuals both in the vet centers and the VAs, but I'm saying it needs to go beyond that. that these opportunities need to be spread throughout our communities and all of our faith communities. Um, it's certainly in whatever we can do with the VA and the vet center, but also just as individuals to provide those arms. I, I witnessed a Vietnam veteran who had never shared his story, I didn't know his story, broke down in tears hearing another veteran share his story and be heard. And he told me it's the first time I've ever felt welcomed home. He had said, I've never ever felt welcomed home, but watching somebody else be listened to. And so I'm, I'm just asking each of you to be open, to be a vehicle for that grace in whatever way you can, because you are needed. There are people who experience things in Vietnam. We've had World War II vets come to us and say, I shut this down for 50 years and now you want me to talk about it. I tried not to think about it. And they're not saying I was a hero, they're saying there's things I try not to think about. Vietnam vets, and now vets coming back much more recently. You're, the community is an incredible resource if we can open our hearts and just ask where could we be a vehicle for this healing. That you may not have had any interest in any of these wars starting and yet you have the possibility of being a vehicle. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, I would really welcome everybody's uh, sincere questions and their personal responses. I'm going to try to discourage speechifying um, if possible. And um, I'm going to ask somebody else to sort of be a timekeeper, try to keep your comments brief because I have a feeling there's going to be quite a lot of them. Um, I'm going to acknowledge, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot, ask you to raise your hand. I'm so glad you could make it. Steve Connor back there is our incredibly, incredibly dedicated veterans agent from the town of Northampton and many other towns nearby. Um, Amherst, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hilltop, yeah. Scott and I'm incredibly grateful that he's here because there is, you would need, you know, honestly a PhD to keep track of all the different things you're going to know to do his job. <laughs> so when somebody calls me, I'm like, oh, thank you, Steve, for existing. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, Steve's uh, uh, totally, I feel totally confident in sending you to him if you have any questions about a veteran that you know or question of, of help that they might be able to get. And I left a whole bunch of my cards out here on the table with Brian at the Vet Center. So my business cards are there in case anybody needs them. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much for coming. Okay, so sir, you in the blue shirt, you had your question, your hand up. Was it just to ha have a break or did you have a question? Okay, great. You're all set. Okay. I'll be as brief as I can. <laughs> okay. My name is Joe Park. I'm a Vietnam combat veteran. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people that are here today. Uh, veterans or otherwise to, uh, to hear about the veterans and so, so as to educate yourself. Just a, from my perspective, uh, just a few issues that I would like to bring up. One, I mean, and this is not to be detrimental to any of the speakers, I think what they had to say uh, was very valid and, uh, and learn. But you're looking at more or less a truck driver here, or what we would call the grunt, okay? And one of the things that it's taken me well over 30 years to learn, and we have a lot of returning veterans, Afghanistan, and Iraq, Mogadish, Desert Storm, Gulf War, stuff like that, is that not all of us are blessed with the education that some of our speakers have, or maybe some of you in the audience. I worked for Smith College for 25 years. I am definitely not against a higher degree of education. However, this will probably get me a hot water with you guys. There is such a thing as educated derelicts. We need common sense to go with it. Okay. It's like we should work as a community as so far like in Pittsfield or other cities. Let's get uh, a veterans court going here in North Yale. Some of these guys don't need a pass, but they need to be judged by their own peers. We as a community, that would be a big help. 
Yeah. There's actually quite an active group working on that very issue, okay. which Steve is part of and, and a number of others who are. Yeah, sorry. And I don't think there's been a lot in the newspaper about it, but there's been a group meeting for almost two years now, and it really has gotten underway for there to be just what you're talking about, right, right, a, right, a veterans yeah. court. And then, you know, the last thing is that, uh, you know, the veterans returning today are like Vietnam. One, 24 hours you're there, next minute you're back, you know, 24 hours later. It's like, if this could be a joint uh, members of Congress or something, I think one of the things we ought to be advocating for is to keep our veterans, before they get discharged, for 30 days to start to resensitize them. You maybe wouldn't have 26 suicides a day. You maybe wouldn't have some of these things. You know? Yeah. I'm all for whatever you people want to do, but you know, it's like, I'm. Yeah, no, that's definitely a, a real big know. issue is how to reintegrate people in the community in the most successful way. It's not something we had talked about earlier at well, dinner. You, you're not going to, man. Yeah. You're not going to. You can't, take, you can't possibly take a combat veteran, bring him back, put him back into society, and think he's going to acclimate himself. It's not happening. Yeah. It's not happening. The government, us as the people, need to have the, 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 the government set up a program so that these people, when they come back, these veterans, men and women, are kept in as a unit to get reinserted back into society. They don't have that time. Thank you. We also want to encourage any of our panelists to respond to any of the questions. Anybody else? Yes? Brian? Yeah, um, I just actually, it's actually based off what this gentleman was just talking about, I actually came up with a presentation very short, and I'm not going to obviously give it today, but it's actually called From Combat to the Community, and it's um, because what I realized, uh, as well as you know many other people, is it's very difficult for uh, returning veterans to reintegrate back into society. So um, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's at school, because um, I do outreach um, for the Department of Veterans Affairs for the Vet Center, and that's what I see when I'm doing all this stuff, is, I'm seeing a, a very difficult time with the integration process for these guys. And so I realized there was a need to put something like this in place. And so when we go around, what we're doing is we're, I'm working with uh, you know, the VSOs from, the, there's a ton of different veterans organizations. I don't know if you guys realize, but in Western Massachusetts, it's absolutely amazing what these people are doing, like these different, you know, whether it's the state, whether it's the, uh, what, whether it's, uh, the VA, um, or just local groups, uh, private organizations, they're all coming together in this huge conglomerate and they're really starting to do a lot of stuff for veterans in the community. And they're kind of just putting, you know, all of, you know, the, the uh, you know, things, you know, their biases, whatever, aside, and they're saying, you know, we got to really work for these guys and, and do something. So um, be, be on the lookout and just, you're going to start seeing a lot of different things uh, popping up in the near future for veterans in the area. And if you want to talk about that stuff later, I know there's Steve Connor and there's a bunch of other people here that you could talk to. But anyway, that's just real quick on that. So there's a lot going on in regards to that, especially in Western Mass. Then the last thing I want to talk about was post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, it got brought up earlier at, you know, how it's kind of a label, it's a stigma associated with everybody. And so I give a presentation um, out in Gardner Mass Mental Health Conference, and I like to refer to it as a, uh, there was a Marine veteran that um, spoke at a uh, bike rally. And he, I guess it's called spoken word poetry, and he called it post-traumatic growth. And that's what I like to refer to it as, post-traumatic growth. Because if you, if you think of it as a disorder, it just, it just like sticks with like, oh, disorder, you know? But when you say post-traumatic growth, it's like, you know what, it happened, but now it's, there's gonna be setbacks, there's gonna be things that I have to deal with, but it's, it's an experience that, I, that happened, now I have to work through it. And so it's just, it's a growing process. And so I think that that should really start to be in people's minds, is, you know, it's post-traumatic growth, it's just this, this thing that we have to kind of work with in, in the future, but does it. My question's for Captain Kudu. I just want to say thank you for your service and for sharing your story. But uh, uh, my question is a uh, former Navy foreman. I have a lot of friends who are Marines. I was stationed with them. But uh, a lot of them have been asked the same question you were about if you've ever killed anybody. And have you found a good response to that that kind of allows you to keep your respect and without getting too 
too upset about it. It's just someone who you might not feel is very sincere when they ask that, and they're going to challenge you in a way. I think the question that I, would, that I ask now is, what do you want to know? Like, because if they want to hear my story, I'm happy to tell them about it. If they're just curious as to, for more curiosity or about the taboo of it, um, I may be willing to have that talk with them too, because, you know, you don't often get to talk with someone who's killed someone um, that's not in prison. And so if there is, like, learning to know that, I was talking to um, a gentleman here about, about, or I was actually looking at this thing, um, <laughs> taking uh, like a prisoner and, like, it was a veteran prisoner, I think, on this pamphlet here that's, like, talking to a class or whatever. Um, I think getting that kind of perspective of, what really happens in the world is valuable, and people need to understand that. But uh, again, it, it comes to further motivations, and so you kind of turn the question back on a little bit. Right. Thank you. Um, what point you? Carl Marlantis was mentioned, I think, in Bob's book. His book, Matterhorn, is incredible, but he's got a more recent one called What It Takes to Go to War. And one of the things I remember in reading it made a big impression on me was the idea of having people who've experienced I like the post-traumatic growth idea with PTSD or moral injury, go to the uh, basic training facilities. Because I think what's missing in some of the analysis is, as a teenager, there's so much that would fed patriotism. <coughs> our country right or wrong, that was a bumper sticker during Vietnam, our country love it or leave it. And then the lies that are leading to a war in Iraq. So when I hear you I ask that, you were asked the question, would you do it again? I'm deeply troubled if, that, if the rest of that analysis doesn't happen about why are we doing these wars and how can we get young people. That's why what I love about the EP is it goes into schools and tells what war is really like. So you demystify it, you take away the glory, the heroism is not really what, is what, what war is about. The collateral damage gets presented. That's the part that feels like it's out of sync. I, I, I appreciate what you wrote what you've said tonight, lots of it, but that part feels missing. <coughs> I think you're right. I think bringing people to boot camp or OCS or places like that could be valuable. When I was, I was actually a corpsman before I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, there was a corpsman buddy of mine who had deployed, and he had been in a checkpoint. You're not supposed to put corpsmen at checkpoints with guns and stuff like that, but they did because they were short men. And he, they shot a vehicle because the vehicle was, wouldn't stop. And they ended, he ended up killing a baby, like literally killed a baby. Um, and so he used to make baby killer jokes, the guy used to, because he had you know, just no other way to deal with it. And so I was young at that point, you know, I was I just joined the military and I was kind of at that stage where I heard this kind of thing. And like it didn't resonate. Like I didn't think that was possible, I didn't think that could happen to me, I didn't think I could do anything like that. And I think it goes also to the point that the gentleman made who um, was speaking here. Like if you wanted to keep me in, in the military for months or two months after I got back with my unit to talk about these things, there's nothing I wanted more as soon as I got back than to get out. Um, whether it was to get out of the military altogether or just go with my family or go on vacation, like you spent seven months in Afghanistan in a single base in a single area. Like the last thing you want to do is stay with your unit and like hang out and like deal with crap. So you want to get the hell out as fast as you can. So even if you went through the, that kind of training or you went through um, and you brought people in to talk about these things, I don't know that people will be ready to hear it at that point. And so that's a challenge. It's like, you know, not that this is necessarily causing suicide, but you have this huge suicide rate amongst veterans. It's not veterans of my age, it's veterans of your age. It's like people who've been out for 20, 30 years who are then at some point, they like, they think about it, they come back to them. You know, like you're saying, you know, four or five years ago, you know, letting people in be on this buffer. And it's like, when, when do veterans need these things? We can't tell, for every veteran it's different. For some people it's right away, it's the minute that it happens, like with their sergeant, you know, in the bear herd in the tent that they're saying, for some people it's when they're 60 years old and you know maybe they're in the hospital and they start thinking about these things. So when we come with public treatments for these things, they're just not a good way to, to match it with the right time and mindset that people are in. Hey Court, you also have a question? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I was, I was going to be, say something sort of along the same lines. I feel that there's nothing more moving and hearing to me and hearing a veteran who has been through an experience of war talking about it in a way that doesn't glorify it, that doesn't glamorize it. Um, because so many people get dragged into situations under false pretenses and without really understanding it. Who can understand it? And uh, the reality of 
as you are talking about, as what well, everyone that spoke tonight is talking about, is that it's not, it, the outcome is not good for the person that goes into it. It's not a good outcome. It may be uh, an acceptable or a defensible outcome, but it's not a good outcome. And so, do we as a nation prevent that kind of um, collateral damage among our own veteran population by only engaging in combats that are necessary? And what are the values that we are, are uh, engaging in combats about? And are we as a people taking that on when we think about engaging in conflicts? And as we are, are we as young men who are going to combat really taking on as much of the reality of what we're taking on as we possibly can? And so when I hear you speaking, I feel great hope that um, the realities of war, if we understand them before we go into them, are going to prevent so many of these catastrophes because it will be more and more unthinkable at the front end to get involved. It may not be never, but the idea that there will always be wars, that this is human nature, that people are always going to have to do this stupid crap, uh, it is not a, it's not a given. It's a theory. And it may be a rarity as time goes on, especially if we can grapple with the realities in such a way that we, that we weigh uh, before we get into it. And that's to me where these stories, and your story in particular, the, the brave and uh, really, um, you have a, a, a really, you're taking it on for yourself. Nobody's, you're not reading, you know, you are making your own analysis and you're not afraid to report it. And uh, I think that kind of honest truth-telling uh, as a preventative measure can help a lot of people not to find themselves in that situation and can help us as a culture evaluate because veterans can call on us to evaluate before we get into a war with a kind of power that civilians can't. interrupt. I see some people are heading out, which is totally understandable. We do have an evaluation form for the talk tonight. We would love it if any of you could take the time. I'm just going to start handing it out. If you can't do it, that's fine. We have extra pens over here, um, but it would be wonderful for us if you're willing to just, you know, positive or negative, we are interested in your thoughts. <laughs> so. Just to touch on that real quick, the idea that uh, war is inevitable, I agree. I hope it's, I hope I'm wrong. But I think one of the things that's been discouraging from my generation, but discouraging and hopeful. On the one hand, everything that we got that's good in terms of coming back from these wars, we got because Vietnam veterans fought for it. And so that to me shows that we can make progress as a culture to kind of make it better as over time and create a greater understanding. But I also know that we got into these wars because Vietnam veterans who had served in many ways voted for them either in Congress or you know, voting for the president. And I'm not saying that politically right or wrong what that is. I don't we'll be on that now, frankly. But, you know, I would have thought that there might have been more hesitation to go into another war similar to the kind of war that was fought in Vietnam. And that to me, I think, was a little bit disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, that we didn't seem to have learned a lesson on that front in terms of deciding when to go to war, how to go to war, and how we approach that. Um, and so that's why I guess I'm a little bit pessimistic on that topic. But that doesn't prevent you from saying that. I, I agree, but I, I think we need to figure out a way to kind of make sure that the next time we face that decision about whether to fight or not, um, hopefully we've learned something and we can be on a better place. Mm -hmm. There are fewer members of Congress who have served in the military than right now than at any time in the history of our country. Yeah. Jonathan? This is a question for Captain Kudo, and it is genuinely a question. There isn't a hidden statement behind <laughs> it. I really would like a clarification. Uh, and part of it is I read some of the press coverage, both uh, positive and quite hostile, uh, in response to your going uh, public the way you did. And um, you have been quoted, and perhaps you said it in what you wrote that stirred up the hornets, that killing is always wrong. Um, and I'm 
the, the nub of my question is your sense of the wrongness of killing someone who, to use the slang that's current, didn't need to be killed. Somebody who wasn't a bad guy, who turned out to be an utterly innocent civilian. And I thought I heard you say tonight that actually you were left with no residue of despair or sense of pollution or anything else from killing people who needed to be killed to use this land. Uh, would you be kind enough to clarify that and whether for you it's the, uh, the horrible feeling that you're left with from killing somebody who didn't need to be killed that is the nub of your saying killing is all always wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to catch you out in anything. I, I honestly would like to hear your so there's there's two things at play, I think. One is how you feel about what you've done. And that kind of emotional reaction that you have, you can't control it. Uh, you can convince yourself of things. My CEO, when we had this, when we did this, we killed these two guys, uh, he was like, look, nothing's gonna change it, but what I need you to do is convince yourself that you did the right thing. And then you're not gonna feel that way for a while, but eventually you will. And he was right, like, if you just move on and you focus on it and you focus on the right arguments, over time, you become numb to it a little bit. So I think there's that emotional side where with this particular killing, I felt it very strongly. With the killing of any combatants, Sometimes I did feel it, sometimes I didn't feel it. And that's the challenge. There was a, there was a guy who we like red-handed caught planning bomb, like I, I mentioned, and you know, everyone cheered when he died, and we had lost a Marine that day. That first Marine that got killed was that same day. Um, and that felt very ethically clear. Um, it felt that way. I don't think it was that way, but it felt that way. There were other times where we killed a guy who was pretty clear was pretty young. Um, and we had a lot of intelligence saying that once we killed all their main guys, the guys that they were sending down to fight us were just kids that they were basically blown off the street a little bit. So it was more like a gang if you want to think of it that way. And so when you think about that, um, you know, it becomes a question. And you know, do, do these people really deserve to die? Uh, are the kids fighting for their families or for their honor or for their farmland? Or are they like Taliban as you, as you might read in the news? So that becomes a question, but as you go up the chain of command, even if you think about you know, Osama bin Laden and all these people, I guess me for one, I do think there's some element of evil that at some level you may get, you are responsible for your actions and these people have done things that make them morally reprehensible. But killing them, I find hard to justify. And so here's where the logic comes into play. You know, if killing is right in some way, I just can't think of any morality that would say that's true. I just, I honestly can't. So at most, at most, if you're going to justify this ethically, I think you have to say that killing is amoral in this kind of situation, that it's neither good nor bad. Um, but then why do it? I mean, practically you can make a reason, but I think really when we, when we say that it's amoral or it's kind of neutral in that sense, you start saying there's a utilitarian reason. We have to kill this person for the greater good. But how do you judge that greater good? The only way you judge it is by human life's sake. So even there, the idea that saving life is precious is an embedded value in it. So no matter how you look at it, killing, to me at least, um, can't be right. It certainly can't be right. At, at most it can be neutral, but I just don't feel that way either. Um, and if it's just about, you know, killing in war is okay, killing here is wrong, um, then that's basically just saying that I can't do things that won't let me get along with you guys. You know, it's just about fitting in really at that point. And I think that morality has more fundamental attributes than that. So, a little bit philosophical, but I think that's the question that I have is, you know, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, however you want to phrase it. That rule, I believe, is an actual rule that you shouldn't do that kind of thing. And that, at the same time, there is this issue with the greater good, and we deal with that with torture, for example. So I torture this one guy to save all these guys, you know? I mean, most of our ethical dilemmas are based around the tension between these two things. And beforehand, I think, I was more inclined to go either one way or the other completely. And what I realized, too, is when you're here in society, there's a logic that works. Like, you work hard, and you go to school, and you do your homework, you get a job, you go to college, whatever the case may be, you know, you can do the things, and you can plan your life, and you can make, take these steps. In war, there's absolute chaos. And the idea that you can be the best soldier, you might be the first one killed. There's no logic at all to what happens. And that's not just true in war, that's really true outside of America, or outside of developed countries. So, 
once you deal with this kind of chaotic world, all those rules start breaking down a little bit. Um, and they may still be true, fundamentally, but they don't work. They don't work in any trackable or sane way. Mm -hmm. And so when you've seen that, and then you come back, and you have to reconcile these things, while here you might choose the rule-based one, and over there you might choose the utilitarian view, now there's just a total contradiction. That the same world that we live in in America, and the chaotic world that we live in outside these walls, that the ethics are completely different, and yet valid in both extreme situations, just creates an absolute confusion. And so I would hope that someday in the future that ethicists, theologians, are able to reconcile these two ideas, but right now I don't think anyone has. Thank you, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the future of these studies, though. You're kind of surprised that uh, Vietnam Vets uh, let this situation uh, occur. I find it uh, really strange in uh, my experience because I would do with veterans and veterans groups who uh, I work side by side with in the military at war, and when I get together with them, there's very little room with them to even question the patriotism or whatever their, their uh, unthought about uh, thinking and voicing of anything against the military. I think the, those numbers are much larger than those people who I can sit, sit down with and say, that was screwed up, and what are we going to do now? Will your generation lead us when the next thing occurs, which I think will occur, will, will you be able to get your brothers and sisters to step up and go out in the streets and uh, make a huge voice, and, and again, knowing how the media will misrepresent. How do we do that? Do you have any ideas about how we get ready for that next one? We have a couple other people, and we're going to have to wrap it up at some point. There was, okay. um, sorry, there was a woman in the back there, sorry, with the uh, hand shoe. Um, I want to bring up something about, I think that what I've observed with veterans from World War II is they compartmentalize. You know, they didn't want to talk about it, and they compartmentalize it, and they went on with their lives. My dad came back from World War II, a full colonel. He was a combat veteran, an ace pilot, and he went on in the military from the Air National Guard in, in Barnes. And he was a very, very well-respected man, and he created an organization that had a lot of moral force. When he was dying in the hospital, uh, he smoked and he had lung cancer. Mila happened. Mm. And I was very close to my dad. So I went to the hospital and talked with him about it. I said, yeah, what, what, what? you know, I was a young kid in my early 20s. What, what, what is this, Dad? What, you know? And my father looked at me and he said, Carol, it's war. He said, you know, you can read the record. We moved so many miles, took so many prisoners. And then he said, later on in the war, you read the record. We, took, we went so many miles, we took no prisoners. <laughs> And he didn't say another word, and I understood what he was talking about. So, I also understood when the situation came up, and, you know, he was a Republican. He didn't vote for Goldwater. And Goldwater was shaking the right crowd on the Sabres. And I think I understood that the reason he didn't do that was because he understood war. He had experienced it firsthand.